Chapter 19, Part 2 of A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Catherine Edman. A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life by William Law. Chapter 19, Part 2. Chapter 19. Showing how the method of educating daughters makes it difficult for them to enter into the spirit of Christian humility. How miserably they are injured and abused by such an education. The spirit of a better education, represented in the character of Eusebia. Could you think, my children, when you look at the world and see what customs and fashions and pleasures and troubles and projects and tempers employ the hearts and time of mankind, that things were thus, as I have told you? But do not you be affected at these things. The world is in a great dream, and but few people are awake in it. We fancy that we fall into darkness when we die, but, alas, we are most of us in the darkness till then, and the eyes of our souls only then begin to see when our bodily eyes are closing. You see then your state, my children. You are to honor, improve, and perfect the spirit that is within you. You are to prepare it for the kingdom of heaven, to nourish it with the love of God and of virtue, to adorn it with good works, and to make it as holy and heavenly as you can. You are to preserve it from the errors and vanities of the world, to save it from the corruptions of the body, from those false delights and sensual tempers which the body tempts it with. You are to nourish your spirits with pious readings and holy meditations, with watchings, fastings, and prayers, that you may taste and relish and desire that eternal state which is to begin when this life ends. As to your bodies, you are to consider them as poor, perishing things that are sickly and corrupt at present, and will soon drop into common dust. You are to watch over them as enemies that are always trying to tempt and betray you, and so never follow their advice and counsel. You are to consider them as the place and habitation of your souls, and so keep them pure and clean and decent. You are to consider them as the servants and instruments of action, and so give them food and rest and raiment, that they may be strong and healthful to do the duties of a charitable, useful, pious life. Whilst you live thus, you live like yourselves, and whenever you have less regard to your souls, or more regard to your bodies than this comes to, whenever you are more intent upon adorning your persons than upon the perfecting of your souls, you are much more beside yourselves than he that had rather have a laced coat than a healthful body. For this reason, my children, I have taught you nothing that was dangerous for you to learn. I have kept you from everything that might betray you into weakness and folly, or make you think anything fine but a fine mind, anything happy but the favor of God, or anything desirable but to do all the good you possibly can. Instead of the vain, immodest entertainment of plays and operas, I have taught you to delight in visiting the sick and poor. What music and dancing and diversions are to many in the world, that prayers and devotions and psalms are to you. Your hands have not been employed in plaiting the hair and adorning your persons, but in making clothes for the naked. You have not wasted your fortunes upon yourselves, but have added your labor to them, to do more good to other people. Instead of forced shapes, patched faces, genteel airs, and affected motions, I have taught you to conceal your bodies with modest garments, and let the world have nothing to view of you but the plainness, the sincerity, and humility of all your behavior. You know, my children, the high perfection and the great rewards of virginity. You know how it frees from worldly care and troubles, and furnishes means and opportunities of higher advancements in a divine life. Therefore, 
love and esteem and honor virginity bless god for all that glorious company of holy virgins that from the beginning of christianity have in the several ages of the church renounced the cares and pleasures of matrimony to be perpetual examples of solitude contemplation and prayer but as every one has his proper gift from god as i look upon you all to be so many great blessings of a married state so i leave it to your choice either to do as i have done or to aspire after higher degrees of perfection in a virgin state of life i desire nothing i press nothing upon you but to make the most of human life and to aspire after perfection whatever state of life you choose never therefore consider yourself as persons that are to be seen admired and courted by men but as poor sinners that are to save yourselves from the vanities and follies of a miserable world by humility devotion and self-denial learn to live for your own sakes and the service of god and let nothing in the world be of any value with you but that which you can turn into a service to god and a means of your future happiness consider often how powerfully you are called to a virtuous life and what great and glorious things god has done for you to make you in love with everything that can promote his glory think upon the vanity and shortness of human life and let death and eternity be often in your minds for these thoughts will strengthen and exalt your minds make you wise and judicious and truly sensible of the littleness of all human things think of the happiness of prophets and apostles saints and martyrs who are now rejoicing in the presence of god and see themselves possessors of eternal glory and then think how desirable a thing it is to watch and pray and do good as they did that when you die you may have your lot amongst them whether married therefore or unmarried consider yourselves as mothers and sisters as friends and relations to all that want your assistance and never allow yourself to be idle whilst others are in want of anything that your hands can make for them this useful charitable humble employment of yourselves is what i recommend to you with great earnestness as being a substantial part of a wise and pious life and besides the good you will thereby do to other people every virtue of your own heart will be very much improved by it for next to reading meditation and prayer there is nothing that so secures our hearts from foolish passions nothing that preserves so holy and wise a frame of mind as some useful humble employment of ourselves never therefore consider your labor as an amusement that is to get rid of your time and so may be as trifling as you please but consider it as something that is to be serviceable to yourselves and others that is to serve some sober ends of life to save and redeem your time and make it turn to your account when the works of all people shall be tried by fire when you were little i left you to little amusements to please yourselves in any things that were free from harm but as you are now grown up to a knowledge of god and yourselves as your minds are now acquainted with the worth and value of virtue and exalted with the great doctrines of religion you are now to do nothing as children but despise everything that is poor or vain or impertinent you are now to make the labors of your hands suitable to the piety of your hearts and employ themselves for the same ends and with the same spirit as you watch and pray for if there is any good to be done by your labor if you can possibly employ yourself usefully to other people how silly it is how contrary to the wisdom of religion to make that a mere amusement which might as easily be made an exercise of the greatest charity what would you think of the wisdom of him that should employ his time in distilling of waters and making liquors which nobody could use merely to amuse himself with the variety of their colour and clearness when with less labour and expense 
he might satisfy the wants of those who have nothing to drink. Yet he would be as wisely employed as those who are amusing themselves with such tedious works as they neither need nor hardly know how to use when they are finished, when with less labor and expense they might be doing as much good as he that is clothing the naked or visiting the sick. Be glad, therefore, to know the wants of the poorest people, and let your hands be employed in making such mean and ordinary things for them as their necessities require. By thus making your labor a gift and service to the poor, your ordinary work will be changed into a holy service, and made as acceptable to God as your devotions. And as charity is the greatest of all virtues, as it always was the chief temper of the greatest saints, so nothing can make your own charity more amiable in the sight of God than this method of adding your labor to it. The humility also of this employment will be as beneficial to you as the charity of it. It will keep you from all vain and proud thoughts of your own state and distinction in life, and from treating the poor as creatures of a different species. By accustoming yourself to this labor and service to the poor, as the representatives of Jesus Christ, you will soon find your heart softened into the greatest meekness and lowliness towards them. You will reverence their state and condition, think it an honor to serve them, and never be so pleased with yourself as when you are most humbly employed in their service. This will make you true disciples of your meek Lord and Master, who came into the world not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and though he was Lord of all, and amongst the creatures of his own making, yet was amongst them as one that serveth. Christianity has then had its most glorious effects upon your hearts, when it has thus changed your spirit, removed all pride of life from you, and made you delight in humbling yourselves beneath the lowest of all your fellow creatures. Live therefore, my children, as you have begun your lives, in humble labor for the good of others, and let ceremonious visits and vain acquaintances have as little of your time as you possibly can. Contract no foolish friendships or vain fondnesses for particular persons, but love them most that most turn your love towards God and your compassion towards all the world. But, above all, Avoid the conversation of fine-bred fops and beaux, and hate nothing more than the idle discourse, the flattery and compliments of that sort of men, for they are the shame of their own sex, and ought to be the abhorrence of ours. When you go abroad, let humility, modesty, and a decent carriage be all the state that you take upon you and let tenderness, compassion, and good nature be all the fine breeding that you show in any place. If evil speaking, scandal, or backbiting be the conversation where you happen to be, keep your heart and your tongue to yourself. Be as much grieved as if you were amongst cursing and swearing, and retire as soon as you can. Though you intend to marry, Yet let the time never come till you find a man that has those perfections which you have been laboring after yourselves, who is likely to be a friend to all your virtues, and with whom it is better to live than to want the benefit of his example. Love poverty and reverence poor people, as for many reasons so particularly for this, because our blessed Saviour was one of the number and because you may make them all so many friends and advocates with God for you. Visit and converse with them frequently. You will often find simplicity, innocence, patience, fortitude, and great piety amongst them, and where they are not so, your good example may amend them. Rejoice at every opportunity of doing a humble action, and exercising the meekness of your minds, whether it be, as the scripture expresses it, in washing the saints' feet, that is, in waiting upon and serving those that are below you, or in bearing with the haughtiness and ill manners of those that are your equals or above you. For there is nothing better than humility, 
it is the fruitful soil of all virtues and everything that is kind and good naturally grows from it therefore my children pray for and practice humility and reject everything in dress or carriage or conversation that has any appearance of pride strive to do everything that is praiseworthy but do nothing in order to be praised nor think of any reward for all your labors of love and virtue till christ cometh with all his holy angels and above all my children have a care of vain and proud thoughts of your own virtues for as soon as ever people live different from the common way of the world and despise its vanities the devil represents to their minds the height of their own perfections and is content that they should excel in good works provided that he can but make them proud of them therefore watch over your virtues with a jealous eye and reject every vain thought as you would reject the most wicked imagination and think what a loss it would be to you to have the fruit of all your good works devoured by the vanity of your own minds never therefore allow yourselves to despise those who do not follow your rules of life but force your hearts to love them and pray to god for them and let humility be always whispering it into your ears that you yourself would fall from those rules to-morrow if god should leave you to your own strength and wisdom when therefore you have spent days and weeks well do not suffer your hearts to contemplate anything as your own but give all the glory to the goodness of god who has carried you through such rules of holy living as you were not able to observe by your own strength and take care to begin the next day not as proficients in virtue that can do great matters but as poor beginners that want the daily assistance of god to save you from the grossest sins your dear father was a humble watchful pious wise man whilst his sickness would suffer him to talk with me his discourse was chiefly about your education he knew the benefits of humility he saw the ruins which pride made in our sex and therefore he conjured me with the tenderest expressions to renounce the fashionable ways of educating daughters in pride and softness in the care of their beauty and dress and to bring you all up in the plainest simplest instances of a humble holy and industrious life he taught me an admirable rule of humility which he practised all the days of his life which was this to let no morning pass without thinking upon some frailty and infirmity of our own that may put us to confusion make us blush inwardly and entertain a mean opinion of ourselves think therefore my children that the soul of your good father who is now with god speaks to you through my mouth and let the double desire of your father who is gone and of me who am with you prevail upon you to love god to study your own perfection to practice humility and with innocent labor and charity to do all the good that you can to all your fellow creatures till god calls you to another life thus did the pious widow educate her daughters the spirit of this education speaks so plainly for itself that i hope i need say nothing in its justification if we could see it in life as well as read of it in books the world would soon find the happy effects of it a daughter thus educated would be a blessing to any family that she came into a fit companion for a wise man and make him happy in the government of his family and the education of his children and she that either was not inclined or could not dispose of herself well in marriage would know how to live to great and excellent ends in a state of virginity a very ordinary knowledge of the spirit of christianity seems to be enough to convince us that no education can be of true advantage to young women but that which trains them up in humble industry in great plainness of life 
in exact modesty of dress, manners, and carriage, and in strict devotion. For what should a Christian woman be but a plain, unaffected, modest, humble creature, averse to everything in her dress and carriage that can draw the eyes of beholders, or gratify the passions of lewd and amorous persons? How great a stranger must he be to the gospel who does not know that it requires this to be the spirit of a pious woman! Our blessed Saviour saith, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her, hath already committed adultery with her in his heart. Matthew 5, verse 28 Need an education which turns women's minds to the arts and ornaments of dress and beauty be more strongly condemned than by these words? For surely, if the eye is so easily and dangerously betrayed, every art and ornament is sufficiently condemned that naturally tends to betray it. And how can a woman of piety more justly abhor and avoid anything than that which makes her person more a snare and temptation to other people? If lust and wanton eyes are the death of the soul, can any women think themselves innocent who, with naked breasts, patched faces, and every ornament of dress, invite the eye to offend? And as there is no pretense for innocence in such behavior, so neither can they tell how to set any bounds to their guilt. For as they can never know how much or how often they have occasioned sin in other people, so they can never know how much guilt will be placed to their own account. This, one would think, should sufficiently deter every pious woman from everything that might render her the occasion of loose passions in other people. St. Paul, speaking of a thing entirely innocent, reasons after this manner, But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those that are weak, and through thy knowledge thy weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. 1 Corinthians 8, verses 11-13 through 13. Now, if this is the spirit of Christianity, if it requires us to abstain from things thus lawful, innocent, and useful, when there is any danger of betraying our weak brethren into any error thereby, surely it cannot be reckoned too nice or needless a point of conscience for women to avoid such things as are neither innocent nor useful, but naturally tend to corrupt their own hearts and raise ill passions in other people. Surely every woman of Christian piety ought to say, in the spirit of the Apostle, If patching and paint, or any vain adorning of my person, be a natural means of making weak, unwary eyes to offend, I will renounce all these arts as long as I live, lest I should make my fellow creatures to offend. I shall now leave this subject of humility, having said enough, as I hope, to recommend the necessity of making it the constant chief subject of your devotion at this hour of prayer. I have considered the nature and necessity of humility and its great importance to the religious life. I have shown you how many difficulties are formed against it from our natural tempers, the spirit of the world, and the common education of both sexes. These considerations will, I hope, instruct you how to form your prayers for it to the best advantage, and teach you the necessity of letting no day pass without a serious, earnest application to God for the whole spirit of humility, fervently beseeching Him to fill every part of your soul with it, to make it the ruling, constant habit of your mind, that you may not only feel it, but feel all your other tempers arising from it, that you may have no thoughts, no desires, no designs, but such as are the true fruits of a humble, meek, 
and lowly heart that you may always appear poor and little and mean in your own eyes and fully content that others should have the same opinion of you that the whole course of your life your expense your house your dress your manner of eating drinking conversing and doing everything may be so many continual proofs of the true unfeigned humility of your heart that you may look for nothing claim nothing resent nothing that you may go through all the actions and accidents of life calmly and quietly as in the presence of god looking wholly unto him acting wholly for him neither seeking vain applause nor resenting neglect or affronts but doing and receiving everything in the meek and lowly spirit of our lord and saviour jesus christ end of chapter 19 part 2 recorded by catherine edmund